The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Mastering the Art of Precision in the Treatment of HR-Positive Early and Metastatic Breast Cancer, Risk Assessment, Prognostic Testing, and Selection and Sequencing of Therapies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash GHA860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Welcome to Peerview. We're going to be talking about mastering the art of precision in the treatment of hormone receptor positive early as well as metastatic breast cancer today. Uh, I'm Erica Hamilton. I'm at Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm joined by a, a fantastic uh, faculty. Uh, to the right of me is Hope Rugo um, from uh, UCSF. And uh, to the right of her is Kamal Javeri from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And uh, all the way across the stage is Paolo Tarantino uh, at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you tonight. So our goals for today are to augment your knowledge in the evolving clinical roles of standard new and emerging treatment options for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, uh, really talk about sequencing these agents and enhance your ability to provide education to patients. And again, we partnered with both GRASP as well as Living Beyond Breast Cancer. Okay, so first we're going to be talking about navigating the evidence and clinical decisions and implementing strategies to reduce the risk of recurrence in the early setting. So this is our first case. Uh, this is a 45-year-old premenopausal uh, woman. In July of 2022, she had a mass in her right breast that she noticed. Mammogram and ultrasound showed a four centimeter mass, and she also had a suspicious axillary lymph node. Core needle biopsy revealed a high grade, grade three invasive lobular carcinoma, strongly ERPR positive, HER2 zero, and key 67 in the 15 to 20% range. She does have the axillary lymph node biopsy, and it is positive uh, for cancer. She ends up having staging scans that are negative. She also has panel testing that's negative for BRCA alterations. She undergoes surgery and ends up with 4.3 centimeters of grade three invasive lobular carcinoma with one out of three positive lymph nodes. She receives uh, adjuvant, a dose dense AC followed by 12 weeks of paclitaxel, has radiation to her chest wall and to the regional lymph nodes. Okay, so next up is Dr. Rugo. Uh, she's gonna talk to us about adjuvant CDK4-6 uh, inhibition. Great, thanks very much, and uh, excited to see everybody here this evening um, after our, uh, I think, really great first day of scientific presentations at San Antonio, Many, much more to come over the next two days. Uh, so we're gonna talk about adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor, and of course, the uh, key trial for all of us is Monarch-E, uh, where uh, a large number of patients, as you can see here, almost 5,700 patients, uh, with high-risk early-stage breast cancer were randomized to receive, along with their standard adjuvant endocrine therapy, and that could be whatever physician's choice was, a bemaciclib or not. Uh, and there were two cohorts. So the first cohort were patients who had at least four or more positive lymph nodes, or if they had one to three positive lymph nodes, they had to have one of two features, grade three disease or a tumor size of five centimeters or greater. Then there was a small cohort really uh, directed towards investigating an area we'd been interested in for decades, actually, which was how does key 67 uh, affect response to endocrine therapy to targeted agents and prognosis. So that group, 9% of the total population, had one to three positive no lymph nodes and centrally confirmed key 67 of 20% or greater, uh, but they couldn't have grade three disease and they couldn't have uh, a tumor size greater than five centimeters. The treatment duration was two years, and the primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival. And then, of course, to look at this in the high key 67 population was a secondary objective. As you know, we've been reporting data for Monarchy since we had our two-year follow-up. Um, so there was follow-up at two years, uh, and then a little bit longer, and then four years and five years. So the most recent follow-up presented by Nadia Harbeck at ESMO this year, just two months ago, was the five-year uh, overall efficacy analysis. So the data cutoff was in July of this year. So now we can really look at IDFS and distant recurrence-free survival, but it's also really important to keep in mind that oh, it, overall survival is very early to look at overall survival for a patient population with hormone receptor-positive disease. 
So median follow-up you can see is 54 months, and all patients are long off of bamaciclib. It was only two years of therapy, um, and more than 80% of patients were followed for at least two years after finishing a BEMA, which means it's a really a big population now. So here you can see in the red is the two-year course of abemaciclib, and you can see that the curves start to separate uh, shortly before 24 months and continue to separate over time. And to me, the most remarkable aspect of this data is the increasing degree of benefit over time, suggesting a carryover effect that exposure not just to endocrine therapy, but to a targeted agent, a CDK4-6 inhibitor, early could still be reducing recurrence three years after finishing treatment. So now the delta in IDFS is 7.6%, hazard ratio 0.68, uh, highly statistically significant. It's a nominal p-value, less than 0.001. And you can see the IDFS events are more in the patients who received um, the standard endocrine therapy. And then if we look at selected subgroups looking at IDFS, you can see that all of those diamonds really line up to the left of one. So uh, this is, I think, shows you that all of the different subgroups benefit. And the only subgroups where there wasn't clear benefit were really very, very small groups where you really couldn't tell exactly what the impact was. But I think that's so encouraging when you see it didn't matter whether you were taking tamoxifen or an AI, uh, whether or not you had stage two or three disease, what size your tumor was, et cetera. Now, the other uh, really important endpoint, and I think probably the most important endpoint for oncologists is distant recurrence-free survival. We don't like our patients to get metastatic disease. And here you can see that, similar to IDFS, the difference continues to increase over time. So you can see it beginning 2.5%, now up to 6.7%, with a hazard ratio of 0.675, a lot more events in the patients receiving endocrine therapy alone, again, a nominal p-value of less than 0.001. Um, so, and you know, I think it's encouraging for all of us to see that the curves are continuing to separate. Now, you know, overall survival, still not enough events. What does that mean? It's great for our patients. Patients are living longer now than ever before who have hormone receptor positive metastatic disease. So that's not a downside. But of course, we want to see overall survival benefit when we're giving patients two years of a CDK4-6 inhibitor who have high risk early stage hormone receptor positive breast cancer. So one endpoint that we found, which I think is very interesting, is fewer patients are alive with metastatic disease who are in the abemaciclib arm. And that's depicted in these bar graph in the green colored bars. So less patients alive with metastatic disease, uh, deaths with, uh, due to breast cancer. If you look at the overall survival at the interim analysis three, which is the one we were talking about at ESMO, you can see there are numerically less events. But these numbers are still very small, thankfully. And a small number of patients died for other reasons, thankfully no difference between the arms. Now, one of the things that we're really interested in is the impact of key 67. So I'm not showing you that here due to time, and also that wasn't a main point of the ESMO presentation, but it was shown at the last presentation uh, update, which I think was at San Antonio last year. And key 67 is clearly a prognostic factor. There's worse outcome in patients who have high key 67, and 20% seem to be a reasonable cutoff based on previous studies and now defined here. Uh, but it didn't impact the benefit of abemaciclib. Hazard ratios are the same. Abemaciclib worked equally well whether you had a high key 67 or low. And you can see that here in cohort two, very much smaller numbers in cohort two, but similar benefits in terms of the uh, IDFS now, you know, the, and the DRFS. If you look at the hazard ratios, they look a little bit different, but the number of patients in cohort two is small. And the follow-up actually is a little shorter in cohort two because we enrolled that last. <clears throat> what about safety? Well. Good for all of us to know that if you take two years of abemaciclib and you stop it, all the toxicity goes away. So there's no long-term toxicity, no new safety events. Um, so that's actually really good. We don't see long-term toxicity uh, from these agents. So uh, based on this data, actually, and the data actually from four years, um, which was before this presentation, so from San Antonio last year, the FDA changed their tune a little bit. They had originally improved uh, abemaciclib only in patients who met the study criteria and had a key 67 of 20% or greater, but then they could see with longer follow-up that key 67 was not a factor that predicted benefit, um, so they took away that requirement. So now, really, you can use abemaciclib in patients who uh, qualif would qualify for the Monarch E trial, so that's very helpful. 
Now, we have a second trial that has reported positive data. This is great uh, situation for our patients with early stage hormone receptor positive disease, ribociclib. So the Natalie trial actually looked at two different things. So one is to extend out the exposure to the CDK4-6 inhibitor to three years versus two years, and then to use a lower dose of ribociclib than was used in the metastatic setting where more than 50% of patients required dose reductions, and dose reductions didn't impact efficacy in a very nice analysis. Also, because of the QT prolongation and drug-drug interaction with ribociclib, you could only receive letrozole or anastrozole, and tamoxifen was prohibited, as was exemestane. In fact, one of my patients changed to exemestane with their outside doctor. I had to go off study. So the idea was not to sort of get difficult situations that we couldn't manage in terms of toxicity. The eligibility also was broader, so they wanted to include a patient who had no negative disease. These patients had either had grade two histology and a high either oncotype DX recurrence score, high risk genomic risk profile, or high key 67 of 20% or greater, or grade three histology. And then anybody with node positive disease uh, was eligible for this. And then they, what they did at the, uh, when the trial was nearing completion was add on 1,000 patients who had higher risk features uh, because of the uh, Monarch E results to try and really power this to see a difference if patients had a higher risk of recurrence. So patients were randomized to ribociclib and then their non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor and patients who were premenopausal, just like the Monarch E trial, received ovarian function suppression with a primary endpoint of IDFS using steep criteria. So uh, as uh, Dennis Slayman presented at ASCO this year, Natalie uh, met an IDFS endpoint. Uh, and interestingly, it met this endpoint when only 20% of patients had completed three years of therapy, which of course brings up the question about the optimal duration of CDK4-6 inhibitors, which we're not gonna know the answer to. Uh, but you can see here that the hazard ratio is 0.748 uh, and p-value 0.0014 with an absolute benefit at three years at 3.3%. At this meeting, Natalie will present updated data with an additional about six months of follow-up. Uh, at this time, it was about 34 months of median follow-up. But again, a lot of people are still on treatment, and there will be more people off treatment now. They also showed a significant distant disease-free survival as well, a slightly lower uh, uh, delta. Uh, as you would expect. So now across clinically relevant subgroups, uh, these are the absolute differences. It's a little bit hard to read because it's not a real forest plot, but it shows you the hazard ratios um, on the far right-hand side for you, showing that across all of these different subgroups, you're seeing similar hazard ratios. That's really what you should look at. The one thing I will say is there's a smaller number of patients with no negative disease, and those hazard ratio, the confidence interval crosses one in a number of these different categories like stage two disease, not in stage three disease, and that really just has to do a short follow-up. We need longer follow-up to see what's happening in that patient group. And then they used 400 milligrams, so there was a big interest in whether or not there was less toxicity. Indeed, there was a little less grade three or greater neutropenia, and importantly, less QT prolongation, although it was still seen, um, and no difference in ILD pneumonitis. One of the issues that requi required holding drug and even discontinuation uh, was liver-related adverse events with transaminitis, uh, and that was the most common cause of discontinuation of uh, ribociclib. And here you can see that there are still liver-related AEs at 400 milligrams, although holding the drug and dose reducing has been effective in a variety of settings. So I'm gonna hand it back to you to the case. Okay, so uh, we aren't going to go through it completely again, um, but, you know, again, 45-year-old uh, lady, 4-centimeter mass, grade 3, high-grade invasive lobular carcinoma, key 67, 15 to 20 percent positive lymph node, um, and she ends up with 4.3 centimeter disease, AC to T, has radiation, and so uh, this is a little bit of something for us to discuss. Uh, this was uh, patient experience survey findings. Um, this was pulled for living beyond breast cancer as well as GRASP and a peer review patient experience. And the question was, if you've been diagnosed with early breast cancer, has your doctor or another member of the cancer team discussed the risk of recurrence of your breast cancer so, with you? And you'll see, uh, we're not doing a horrible job. 61% uh, said yes, that was clearly discussed and it helped me uh, understand uh, my risk and what my options were. 22% said yes, but I didn't really understand that risk of recurrence. 
and 16% said, no, uh, I don't remember. And I think risk can be particularly hard for patients, right, to understand, well, what is a 6% risk benefit? You know, any tricks, uh, Kamal, of how, how you explain this to patients to make it a little bit more actionable? Well, I do believe that absolute numbers helps. And in particular, every time we decide to utilize or not to utilize a drug, we are balancing risks and benefits. And, and of course, I think both discussing the benefits in terms of percentage, but also absolute numbers helps with the patient. And, and so try to figure how much of the risk of recurrence you can cut. And one challenge I find is that the risk of recurrence, we know that is on a long time. We know that patients can recur over 10 or more years, and, and so I think you need to create a cut point for that, and I would love to hear how do Komal does this, and w what cut point you utilize for patients when discuss the risk. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it can be challenging because there are so many things that we can uh, use as examples for risk reduction, but it's not just the adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor we're referring to here. For a high-risk patient population, we're also bringing in the flavor for adjuvant chemotherapy and what benefit that might bring in. Sometimes when we have the genomic risk scores, that can be very helpful. I usually print them out. I actually, you know, sketch it out and talk to them about the numbers that are printed out and then explain what the benefit from the adjuvant endocrine therapy and the addition of chemotherapy would come from. And then talking about absolute numbers with the addition of adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitors. And then many a times with this high-risk patient population, we also use, you know, uh, bisphosphonates and bone modifying agents to further highlight. So I think it also becomes a little easier. I think the context about you know, the higher the risk, I think sometimes the perception and the threshold for what that risk reduction would look like from a patient perspective is also there. For a lower risk patient population, it might be a little trickier to justify something. So that risk benefit ratio of toxicity is also a very important discussion to bring in with the efficacy. Yeah, I think those are great points. I, I think sometimes it's trickier with ER positive breast cancer because that risk goes for so long. So you don't want to scare people, but the reality is, is that they can recur very late, right? And so this decision that they're making now can really impact things for quite a bit away. Yep. What, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, we do talk to people, but I think, you know, you want to balance it between scaring people and, uh, and uh, advising them correctly. So it's hard. I mean, it's easy for stage one disease. We use RSC Clin on the, you know, we can go in and show people. But even then, it's sometimes really shocking for people what the risk is. So you have to kind of comment on the fact that these aren't perfect or individual. But for patients who have multiple positive nodes, it's a really big issue. And I do talk about recurrence risk and that it's very long in duration. And I think the other thing is, you know, once we've made the decision already, we've made chemo decision, right? We talk about the fact that, you know, we can rescue with CDK4-6 inhibition now. We'll give endocrine therapy. And I have to say, I have occasionally continued the abema after two years in a very high risk patient, uh, very high risk. You know, you have these people with 10 positive nodes. And so it doesn't, it's hard to stop. Um, and it's hard to stop the AI. But we also talk about person, you know, things that patients can do themselves to try and mitigate risk. Trouble is, you know, a lot of my patients are, you know, exercise all the time, aren't particularly overweight, they don't smoke cigarettes, they're not doing, they're not drinking a lot of alcohol. But I think we can talk about things that patients have some control over. Continuing those activities is one thing. I think the one thing that I would add is like when we have these conversations and initial con consultations with our patients when we're going over this whole slew of Don't uh, do it treatments, all. yeah, when you do it all, <laughs> it's, it's really overwhelming and scary. And so bringing that up again at the next follow-up to try and see is there anything that you want to look at and, you know, giving them patient materials on adjuvant endocrine therapy or the chemotherapy they're going to get or adjuvant CDK4-6 inhibitor and bringing that conversation back in in the follow-up appointment sometimes can give a sense. So what did you understand from our conversation from last time? Is there something more that you would like to discuss, perhaps those Multiple kind of strategies times. help, because it's, it's a lot of overwhelming information. Right, and then reminding again at year one, two, and two, and three. three. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I didn't know anything about the CDK4-6 inhibitor. <laughs> okay, so what <laughs> adjuvant endocrine therapy would you be thinking about for this premenopausal uh, patient that was lymph node positive? Uh, Dr. Tarantino, maybe we'll go down to you. Ovarian suppression AI, ovarian suppression tamoxifen, or tamoxifen so we're talking of a premenopausal patient and a high-risk tumor, node positive with high-risk features. I do believe that ovarian function suppression is important in this case. And it comes with side effects, and it is important, of course, to discuss with the patient. But at the same time, we know that the soft and text trials showed um, a meaningful, both statistically and clinical advantage in by the addition of ovarian suppression. And we also know that AI are superior to tamoxifen. In, in that case, I would definitely try ovarian function suppression and AI, knowing 
assume that if the regimen is not well tolerated, there's many strategies can, that can be utilized, including changing the type of AI. It hap often happens that if you utilize um, a non-steroidal aromatized inhibitor, you can change it to a steroidal one with benefit on side effects, or even utilize tamoxifen, because we also know that ovarian function suppression plus tamoxifen is superior to tamoxifen. Great, well said. Dr. Javeri, would you offer adjuvant CDK46 here, and if so, which one? Yeah, I would. Uh, I think given the high-risk nature of the cancer, I think I would. And uh, right now, I would go with abamaciclib because that's all we have approved uh, at this point, and the maturity of the data speaks for itself in terms of our comfort level for understanding the efficacy benefits that we have. Certainly, we discuss the toxicity profile with the patients and make sure they understand what we can do to make it better. Dr. Rugo, I'm going to throw the difficult question at you. <laughs> Say we get uh, approval of ribocyclob. How are you going to decide who might get abamaciclib versus ribocyclob? You know, I think that uh, we're likely to get approval for ribocyclob when we have a little bit more data, is my guess. And that little bit more data may help us make decisions. I mean, on the one hand, you have a drug which uh, doesn't cause diarrhea, but you have to monitor liver function tests, and it's a year longer uh, to see the benefit. So I think you just have to talk to patients about it, and we are going to have to have the data from all of that in order to discuss it. I think, you know, we had talked about, you know, would we give a BEMA for higher risk patients versus lower risk, but, you know, there were plenty of higher risk patients in Natalie, too. So I think it's really going to depend on the robustness of the data and looking at uh, what we have when we do have drug approval, which isn't yet, so... <clears throat> okay, so this case continues. So our patient uh, does go on an LHRH agonist uh, with letrozole. Uh, she also receives adjuvant zoledronic acid uh, and uh, abemacyclob, 150 milligrams BID. Okay, so this t uh, case continues. And speaking of diarrhea, um, this uh, lady has grade two diarrhea for several weeks and then uh, kind of more mild grade one diarrhea that continues. Uh, she's struggling a little bit with fatigue. Um, neutrophil counts are doing okay, uh, 1.8. Um, she's taken a couple six-week breaks off of therapy. Uh, she remained on letrozole and her LHRH. Diarrhea and fatigue do improve off therapy. She's kind of anxious about continuing uh, her abemacyclib. She's anxious about discontinuing. She's struggling. She's not really sure what to do. Um, where would we go from here? Uh, so briefly, this is a little bit of data about abemacyclib uh, dose holds and reductions uh, as part of the study. So we see that 42% of patients on study actually did have at least one dose reduction. And so I find this number very helpful when I'm talking to a patient because people really struggle about, well, if this drug is going to be beneficial for me and I take less of it, does that mean that I'm hurting myself? And to say, well, you know, in the trial where we saw this benefit, in fact, almost half of people did have to have a dose reduction. So, you know, this isn't abnormal. There's nothing wrong with you, right? Um, and mainly that these dose reductions uh, were due to diarrhea, less frequently neutropenia and fatigue. So factors associated with increased risk of uh, treatment discontinuation was certainly our older patients, uh, similarly postmenopausal, that goes uh, along with that one to three positive nodes instead of four plus positive nodes. So perhaps this indicates that people that really felt that they were at higher risk, um, you know, really tried to make it work, but lower risk patients thought that the risk benefit ratio was a little bit different. And those patients with more pre uh, comorbidities. Um, so, you know, those that may already be struggling with health conditions uh, at baseline. So this was a uh, analysis looking at relative dose intensity. So uh, in relative uh, to the original prescribed dose, how much of the abemacyclib were patients taking, and did that impact how they did? So you can see these uh, three different colors, a zero to 66%, 66 to 93, and greater than 93. And you see that even for those patients that uh, did a dose um, reduce, um, that it really looked like uh, invasive disease-free survival rates were similar across these groups. So I think, you know, we now have a little bit of data to say, you know, yes, people did have to reduce on trial. And in fact, when we look at people that had dose reductions, it didn't look like they did any worse than those who didn't. And we have to remember, you know, that this is a flat rate dosing. It's not weight-based, et cetera. And so some people really may be getting exposure to the drug that's different from somebody else. Uh, and so we need to make sure that it's tolerable for the individual patients. Um, what about the question of our older patients? And so you can see uh, the age split here is less than 65 years of age uh, compared to 65 and older, and you really see similar benefits. And so I think this gets at the question of some people saying, 
well, I think my older patients have uh, cancer with better biology, and so they may just not need this. So it really appeared that when you select for these high-risk characteristics, the grade, the tumor size, the number of lymph nodes, that even our patients that are older benefited from adding adjuvant of abacyclib just as much as our younger patients did. And then what about safety? Um, safety looks pretty similar. Um, you know, a, a couple of uh, exceptions. Um, we don't see a whole lot of differences in neutropenia. Uh, we do uh, maybe uh, see um, a little bit less uh, diarrhea overall, but more uh, severe uh, diarrhea. Um, so 7% versus 12% um, in the 65 cutoff. Um, but, you know, overall, uh, I think our older patients certainly are able to tolerate abemocyclib, and I think this is a drug that we certainly can use dose res reductions if needed. Uh, Dr. Rugo, um, how do you typically manage diarrhea um, for abemocyclib? Is there anything you do prophylactically? How do you counsel patients? Well, so I talk to patients right up front about the diarrhea because, you know, my experience when we first started using uh, neratinib, it was a good example, was that, you know, people got um, diarrhea. So, you know, the, the thing is that I learned that, and I had talked to that patient about it, but, and given her Imodium, but she didn't take it, you know, the loperamide. But in this situation, we're very careful about instructing patients. It doesn't happen as rapidly as neratinib, but it's definitely happening in the first two weeks. So I say, you get bad diarrhea, just hold the drug, don't take a pill, call us. You know, don't worry about missing a pill if you're having diarrhea. Always have loperamide in your purse or pocket or whatever uh, thing you carry with you. Uh, because, you know, I had a patient went to work, you know, and she's some distance from home, and then she was having diarrhea, but she didn't bring any of her loperamide, and she didn't go out to get it. You know, it's kind of silly things that maybe you can help people. Patient went on a hike in the woods. Like, take the loperamide before you go on a hike. That would be good. So, and if you're gonna, one of the things my, one of my patients taught me was that if you're gonna go out and have a big salad outside, take a prophylactic loperamide. And the other thing is that people think they have to take a whole pill. So I tell everybody, take a half a pill, and then you won't get as constipated. And eventually, over time, we get the right dose of abama and the right sequence of prevention. So maybe it's every other day loperamide, maybe it's a half a pill, and then we reduce the dose. You know, there's a lot you can do. Absolutely. Dr. Tarantino, um, how do you help facilitate adherence for your patients? Do you talk about the possibility of dose reduction up front, or do you say, call me before you stop this? How do you handle that? Well, I do believe that the risk of recurrence itself helps to determine how important it is. And also, now that we have updated data that show what a, an important benefit we can achieve with, with abemocycle, it's important to discuss that benefit. And, and of course, also discussing that those reductions can help. And even in patients that, had that were clinical trial participants, so selected based on inclusion criteria, more than a third of them required those reductions. So I don't talk about it up front usually, or at least don't recommend that immediately immediately, but I do recommend it as soon as there are side effects that are impairing quali quality of life, because I do believe that, of course, just as we want to reduce risk of recurrence, we want to maintain as much as possible the quality of life of patients. So many patients end up reducing at least one dose level, and, and it's fine, it's absolutely fine, but, but it's important to find that right dose, the right dose of abema, the right dose of, of loperamide, and of course always recommending standard things like hydration and, and, and in general to maintain a, a good uh, um, exercise and a good style of, of life. Fantastic. Okay, rapid fire. A um, couple of questions we have uh, coming in. Would you start ribo or abemocyclib uh, for a patient that had already done two years of adjuvant therapy, very high risk? So what's your cutoff to going back and adding one? Right now, I would just stick with the two year of adjuvant abemocyclib and not add more. What about somebody that didn't start in initially? How, how long do you feel comfortable on somebody being on AI before you add it in? You mean when the timing of initiation? So the trial really allowed 16 months from the time of surgery, the randomization from time for surgery. Patients could have been on endocrine therapy for up to three months, uh, at least in the monarchy in terms of initiation. Um, if it was closer to that time point, I think I'll be fine uh, doing that. Too delayed, maybe not making sense. We just don't have that data. But I think on an individual patient discussion and basis, I'll be open to discussing that. We're in the Wild West. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, more Always. Wild West. Uh, Dr. Rugo, <laughs> how do you feel about patients that are eligible for Olaparib? Are you picking Olaparib over CDK? Would you ever use them sequentially? How are you handling that? The answer is yes, Olaparib over CDK because it's targeted to the 
uh, I think the tumor biology, the only, I think the only exception would be somebody whose cancer clearly progressed on <coughs> platinum, where I think Olaparib might be a little less beneficial, but we only really see that in triple negative disease, so it's not a question. Sequential, yes. I think, you know, we see these people who have, uh, unfortunately, multiple positive nodes after neoadjuvant therapy, and so we'll give Olaparib, and then after one year, start the abemaciclib. And, you know, in general, people are on board about it because of the high-risk nature of their disease, so I don't have a big problem with it. And I am willing to start that far out, so why wouldn't I start that far out? What I found was after the drug was approved, and I brought it up to patients who had high-risk disease. They were like, what? No. <laughs> you know, I'm not taking more I mean, treatment fortunately, now. <laughs> fortunately, the, the incidence of having mm. germline BRCA2 mutations in ER-positive breast cancer with high risk is not as prevalent. But yes, for that patient population, data-free zones, I'll be open to doing that. But just, yeah, yeah, to kind of just generalize that, I think we don't know the benefit of that or the detriment of that. Dr. Tarantino, yes or no, do you use Key 67 anymore to pick out these patients? Okay, I love it. And would you have done neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this case? If there was palpable lymphadenopathy or a biopsy proven lymph node, then absolutely yes. Okay. Um, it's a lobular cancer. I think I was okay but with the way it was handled. Just to qualify the key 67, if you have a patient who doesn't fit into cohort that. one, but fits into cohort two, I would give them a bemaciclib. So if they were, you know, had a tumor size under five centimeters and not grade three, but had a key 67 over 20% and residual disease, then I would give a BEMA. So I still do use it, but in a more limited way. I do exactly what you do yeah. as well. So and if you have a smaller tumor size, but not grade three, then I will go and look for a key 67 to justify the But we're not feeling like everybody still no. needs to have the key 67 with the original. Unlike the original FDA okay. guidance, we're not doing that anymore. Okay, now we are going to move on to hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer and talking about selection and sequencing of therapies. So 68-year-old woman with a history of uh, breast cancer. She was a T2, N2, grade 3, uh, ER positive strong, PR 50%, HER2 1+. Plus. She had adjuvant chemotherapy, radiation, and then adjuvant aromatase inhibitor for four years before discontinuing because of side effects. She had arthralgias. Five months later, she developed hip pain and she had lytic bone lesions. Staging scans revealed not only the bone mets involving spine, hip, and ribs, but also liver mets. And a biopsy of her liver uh, continued to show ERPR positive, HER2 zero now, BRCA negative breast cancer. So Dr. Javeri, let's walk through some of the data. Sounds good, thank you. All right, so talking about CDK4-6 inhibitors, what is their role in the metastatic setting? And this is really just a table summarizing all the data that we have across the three CDK4-6 inhibitors that are currently approved, namely palbociclib through the Paloma studies, ribociclib through the Mona Lisa trials, and then abemaciclib through the Monarch studies. And this is where we saw that across all of these trials, regardless of the menopausal status, we did see a consistent benefit, and the hazard ratios for the primary endpoint, which was median progression-free survival, was consistent consistent or look similar across all of these studies, de suggesting that this is a class effect in terms of deriving the median progression free survival benefit regardless of what agent was utilized. Now taking a deeper dive, now we also have uh, overall survival data, which was not really the primary endpoint of these studies, but we have that available through these studies. And this is an example from the Mona Lisa 2 trial, where patients were randomized to receiving ribociclib with letrozole versus letrozole placebo, and you see that there is a statistically significant improvement in overall survival from 51 months in the control arm to 63.9 months. So over five years of overall survival, something that we did not see before CDK4-6 inhibitors uh, entered clinic. So very impressive data there. We also saw that in the Monarch 3. This is data that was presented at ESMO um, Breast this uh, year, which was the interim analysis two for overall survival for Monarch 3. This is, again, your first-line trial, but with abemaciclib. Here, again, numerically, we saw an improvement from 54.5 months to 67 months. Hazard ratio is 0.75, but this was a pre-planned uh, interim analysis two. At this meeting, actually, we did hear the results of the final overall survival results from this patient population that was presented by Matt Getz. And here, again, we see the numerical improvement, which is not insignificant. We see an improvement from 54 months to nearly 67 months. And so this is really um, a big numerical difference. The hazard ratio is 0 0.8. 
somehow it did not meet the statistical um, uh, significance. But I'd like to point out that the patient population here, if you think about the first-line patient population for all CDK4-6 inhibitors, this was a smaller uh, a patient population size. The sample size was smaller and was a two-is-to-one randomization. It could be a numbers game, but at least we see that numerically and looking at the curves that we saw that there is a benefit seen with overall survival, which was not the primary endpoint. Now, slightly distinct here or different here with the Paloma 2 study where palbociclib over survival we're talking about here, the curves are kind of more overlapping and we did not necessarily see the, uh, the numerical gain that we saw with other um, CDK4-6 inhibitors, but this was the first CDK4-6 inhibitor, again, not powered for overall survival. The median follow-up here is 7.5 years. There was missing survival data, which was 13% uh, in the palbociclib arm, 21% in the control arm, and more crossover to CDK4-6 inhibitors in the control arm. Of course, this was the first study, 27% versus 12%, and 10% of the patients continue on palbociclib and letrozole at the 7.5-year follow-up. So really, we don't have a very good understanding of why this could have been uh, happening, but perhaps a few of these factors do make sense. What is comforting to see that at least when we look at the real-world data, we do see that Overall survival with palbociclib was seen in this periodic X study before and after the adjustments that we do for uh, these real-world data sets with respect to statistical analyses. And median overall survival was, statistically, uh, signif was significantly longer among patients who did receive palbociclib with AI alone, both before and after adjustments of these uh, analyses. So one might question, could there be differences between the CDK4-6 inhibitors preclinically, which might potentially explain those differences in overall survival? Certainly preclinically, we think that ribociclib and abamaciclib are a little bit more CDK4 selective compared to CDK6. Could that explain the difference? We really do not have head-to-head -head trials, with the exception of the Harmonia trial listed here, which is in a HER2-enriched patient population where we're doing a head-to-head -head comparison of ribociclib with AI with uh, uh, letrozole with palbociclib in that specific patient population, there are no other prospective head-to-head -head comparison trials for us to really say that one CDK4-6 is inferior to the other. That brings us to our um, uh, question about what do we do, I guess. So how do you currently choose among CDK4-6 inhibitors in the first-line setting, and has your practice changed, Dr. Tarantino? I do feel that the discrepant results between PFS and OS kind of challenge also our idea of, of these drugs because we really saw the same consistent as a ratio, almost a halving in the risk of progression with the three CDKs, palbocyclib, ribocyclib, and bemacyclib. We were expecting the same in terms of our survival, whereas we do see different results. And, and they had an impact on guidelines. And CCN guidelines list ribocyclib as the preferred agent. A and I do believe that currently with the data we have is the data is mostly supported by, by the data. At the same time, we also have to um, discuss with the patients all of these complications, all of these differences between the trial and also the difference in toxicity. So sometimes a, a patient that has a baseline comorbidities that may make it uh, complex, for instance, cardiologic comorbidities may make it more sense, um, th there may be more sense in utilizing abemacyclib. They have got an important numerical advantage in overall survival. And so I do believe that there is a role also for the, for the other CDK4-6 inhibitors, but ribocyclib definitely has got the strongest data to my opinion. Absolutely agree. So let's go back to our case. Uh, she did start therapy with fulvestrant and palbociclib uh, and had a good response, but she developed progressive fatigue after 12 months of therapy. And what would you discuss with this patient, uh, Dr. Javeri, in terms of uh, fatigue she's been on for 12 months? Yeah, so I think, you know, sometimes when we talk about grade three toxicities and we just talk about otherwise low-grade toxicities and we club the low-grade toxicities of grade two with grade one can be very tricky because an intolerable grade two can be as significant for a patient as a grade three or four toxicity. So if a patient is really struggling with progressive fatigue or a, a, a intolerable grade two toxicity, I would think about dose reduction and consider that for a patient. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the uh, patient-centered dosing initiative. It's a very busy slide, uh, but essentially on the left, it was a patient survey uh, 1,221 patients that had metastatic breast cancer on the right, an oncologist survey, 119 uh, U.S. oncologists, and really just talking about uh, physician estimates, 47% uh, you know, required a treatment-related uh, adverse event, had to go to the hospital, had to have a treatment break, et cetera, and then really asking patients how they feel about dosing 
and 86% of patients reported experiencing a significant treatment related to adverse event from their perspective. Uh, and uh, really talking about mitigation strategies, um, showing that 83% of patients, when dose reduced, felt that they did feel better on that dose reduction, and 92% saying that they do want to talk to their physicians about dose reductions really to improve quality of life. So I think this is important for us to keep in mind. And you know, that whole project, just to interject, is such an amazing project led by a uh, group of patient advocates who brought in a group of physicians, which I was really honored to participate in. And uh, that data not only was a platform presentation, a huge amount of work uh, for the group, uh, particularly our advocates, and uh, then was a publication actually by um, Ann Loser. So fulvestrin and palbociclib, uh, she develops asymptomatic uh, progression in the bone, but she does have 1.5 centimeter uh, new liver lesions and CTDNA reveals both an ESR1 mutation and a PI3 kinase mutation. So we're trying to make things a little complicated for you tonight, trying to keep you awake. Do you have a comment, Dr. Rigo? Yeah, I, you know, this is a patient who relapsed within six months of her last dose of an aromatase inhibitor. So in that situation, although we want to give a CDK4 first, I might do NGS also at that same time, whereas I don't normally, if a patient's going to start an NAI and a CDK4-6 inhibitor, we'll hear data on Friday morning um, that will be presented by our very own Dr. Javeri, who about uh, a trial where patients who had exactly this situation with a PI3 kinase mutation were randomized to receive a PI3 kinase inhibitor with palbociclib and fulvestrin versus placebo, and that drug is in evolucib. And uh, by the press release, it showed a significant improvement in progression-free survival. So this may really change our way of uh, entirely how we think about patients in this early relapse setting. Yeah, I agree. This case is a little <laughs> bit unusual because she relapsed, you know, very close to AI, but then did very well on first-line fulvestrin palbo. So, you know, a little bit You wonder if she was taking the AI. That's well, the main thing. That's, that, you know. that's a good point. <laughs> Okay, continue. I will, okay, so just looking at those list of options, you can tell how complicated it is to figure out what patients should really be recommended for or what should we think about giving a patient population. So let's talk about, should we continue CDK4-6 beyond progression on a CDK4-6 inhibitor and what did we learn from all the trials that have been reported and what trials are coming our way? So this is the phase two maintain trial and this study was looking at the question of when a patient has an AI and a CDK4-6 as a first-line therapy predominantly, when you switch the endocrine partner and when you switch also a CDK4-6 inhibitor, is there a benefit to that approach in the second-line setting post-progression? So these were patients who predominantly got palbociclib, about 87% of them, predominantly got AI, and then were randomized to a ribociclib switch and a switch of the endocrine therapy, predominantly getting fulvestrin. Some had um, AI as well versus placebo with endocrine therapy switch, and the primary endpoint here was progression-free survival, and with this approach of where you're switching both the endocrine partner and the CDK4-6 inhibitor, you see that there is an improvement in progression-free survival from 2.76 months to 5.29 months with a hazard ratio of 0.57, which was statistically significant. This is a phase two study, certainly really give us uh, more uh, to think about here, and also confirm some retrospective data sets that we also had suggesting that there might be a role for continuing CDK4-6, those retrospective data sets were with abemaciclib. Unlike this, when we look at the PACE trial, here the concept was when a patient's tumor is progressing on an AI and palbociclib, if we continue the same CDK4-6 inhibitor and just switch the endocrine therapy partner, would we see a benefit here in that case where you're just switching the endocrine partner? They also had an interesting arm, a triplet arm of fulvestrin palbociclib with a checkpoint inhibitor, in this case, avelumab, with a two is to one is to one randomization for the doublet arm getting uh, uh, two is is to one to one, where the triplet arm is in the middle here, and fulvestrin alone is the third arm. And here you see that when you compare the fulvestrin to fulvestrin plus falvo, you really do not see the same benefit you saw in the maintained study. It was an interesting signal that was seen in the triplet arm, which needs further uh, um, you know, exploration of what this means for our patients and how should we study that more. 
Similarly, in the Parmilar trial, which was another trial, again, similar concept where they just switched the endocrine partner but continued the same CDK4-6 inhibitor, we did not see a benefit in that approach. So what do I do in clinic? Do I start using uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor beyond progression for my patients where I don't have a biomarker, perhaps? Uh, in an individual patient, perhaps I've done that, but I have not been doing that routinely. What I'm really eagerly waiting for is data from randomized phase three trials, such as post-monarch, which is gonna address that question with abemaciclib. We have other trials, such as Ember-3, we'll talk about that briefly. It's an oral CERD and has a cohort of patients with CERD plus abemaciclib. And then we also have a new trial with a novel serum, Elaine 3 with lazofoxifene and abemaciclib in ESR1 mutant tumors. So I'm waiting for those phase three larger data sets to inform my clinical practice at this point. Talking about ESR1 mutations, one thing that I would really want to highlight first is that these, unlike big 3 ca mutations, are subclonal mutations. And so for us to really capture them, I think the best way to capture them is through a liquid assay, a ctDNA assay, because when you have subclonal mutations, you want to try and get all of the information from all the tumors rather than just a needle biopsy from one tumor, which might not necessarily pick up the ESR1 mutation from the other sites that might have this. So this is the data suggesting that the CTDNA testing identified more ESR1 mutations than the contemporaneous biopsies, and different metastases may develop different resistance mechanisms, and this is what a CTDNA assay is supposed to do. And so why do we need uh, newer agents when we already have fulvestrin potentially that could help? I think we have limitations with our current agents. We have limitations with their PK profile. We have limitations with uh, not being able to get benefit in all ESR1 mutations. And there are so many newer novel endocrine agents with different distinct mechanisms of action with an ultimate goal of really down-regulating the estrogen receptor with an agent with an optimal therapeutic index and improved efficacy. So all of these efforts have a common goal. It's just that the trying to get there in different places through different mechanisms, which might be slightly distinct, but the goal is the same. And the very first one that we have is based on the data from the phase three Emerald trial, which looked at LSS trend versus physician choice endocrine therapy. These were patients who did not have more than two lines of endocrine therapy, no more than one line of chemotherapy, with dual primary endpoints of progression fee survival and intent to treat patient population and in the ESR1 mutated tumors. 20% of these patients had prior chemotherapy. About half of these patients had one line of um, uh, prior endocrine therapy, and here you can see that the benefit of LSS trend was seen in both overall and ESR1 mutated tumors, but it was deeper and better in the ESR1 mutated tumors. More patients were progression-free at landmark analyses at six and 12 months in the LSS trend arm compared to the physician choice uh, therapy arm. And with respect to overall survival, I think these data are not yet mature, and we need a longer follow-up to be able to further appreciate whether a novel endocrine agent can really, really cause a survival benefit compared to our current approved agents as well. When we specifically looked at the comparison of LSS trend with fulvestrin, so those patients who got fulvestrin because it was physician choice endocrine therapy that was allowed here, again, we saw the same benefit, and the benefit was better, again, even in the ESR1 mutant tumors compared to the delta of benefit that we saw in all patients. This was an interesting analysis presented by Virginia Kaklamani at this meeting last year. And here, what they showed was that if a patient is on a CDK4-6 inhibitor in the first-line metastatic setting for a longer duration of time and also has an ESR1 mutation, which is really a surrogate of ER dependency for this endocrine-sensitive tumor, single-agent LSS trend yielded a median progression fee survival of 8.6 months compared to two months in the standard of care arm. So really, this is just trying to tell you for the right patient population, this is really a very appropriate therapy. Therapy. And this is also um, uh, very safe. When you look at the safety summary, most of the adverse events that were reported were predominantly nausea, which were low grade. And when you think about the discontinuation rates from nausea, they were very, very low. Patients requiring antiemetics for nausea were very, very low as well. Dose reductions were very, very low as well. So favorable toxicity profile, certainly uh, improvement in progression fee survival that we saw that led to its approval this year, and uh, we have that available for our patients now. There are other CERDs being developed. This uh, table is not meant for any cross-trial comparisons here. This is just to provide context and, put, and summarize the data. Uh, Serena, too, is looking at camisestrant, which is another oral CERD, also in phase three trials, including adjuvant studies. And Ember is looking at imlunestrant, again, in phase three trials, both in early and late stage. And what the signal we're seeing, there are distinct patient populations. Some might have more CDK4-6 inhibitors. Some might have more chemotherapy. But we're, what we're seeing is that there is a benefit for CDK4-6 inhibitor, and that benefit can be even better in the ESR1 mutant patient population across these trials. 
We've started combining these oral certs with other targeted therapies, including CDK4-6 inhibitors. This was data we presented last year for immunostrant um, uh, with uh, abemaciclib. And here we see that when immunostrant was uh, combined with abemaciclib with or without an AI, the 12-month TFS rates were similar for the doublet or the triplet arm. There was not an increased rate of uh, uh, safety um, issues that we had seen. There were no drug-drug PK interactions. And I'll be updating this data set and presenting that data actually tomorrow at a poster spotlight uh, for this combination and updated data from monotherapy for immunostrant as well. And EMBER-3 is the phase three trial that is currently um, fully enrolled, and we're awaiting the results to see whether their imlunostrant will also uh, yield benefit in this patient population after patients have had aromatase inhibitors with or without a CDK4-6, and ARM-C is going to evaluate the benefit of imlunostrant plus abemaciclib in this context as well. We presented data for other targeted therapy combinations with imlunostrant at ESMO this past two months ago, I guess, October. And here, you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves for imlunostrant with Everolimus, and you see the median progression-free survival is about 16 months. And when you combine it with uh, Alpelisip in this small patient population of 21 patients, the median progression-free survival is 9.2 months. Um, these are the waterfall plot from that, and the uh, response rate in the Everolimus arm was 21%, response rate in the Alpelisib arm was 58%, and clinical benefit rates for both these combinations was 62%. And these are some select phase three trials that are currently evaluating the SIRDs with novel targeted therapies. So we have LSS trend that is already approved. Elevate is a trial that is looking at various combinations, including Everolimus, Alpelisib, Ribociclib. We have two phase three trials. We have the Evera trial that is looking at Giridestrant with Everolimus and compared to physician choice endocrine therapy with Everolimus. And then we also have the Pioneera trial, which is looking at Giridestrant with a CDK4-6 versus Fulvestrant plus CDK4-6 inhibitor. So a lot of efforts ongoing in late phase, as you can see, to see if the benefit with combinations can be also uh, determined, and then we can offer uh, combinations for these patients as well. So this was post CDK4-6 inhibitors we were looking at. What about if we start using them in the frontline, first-line setting? Would we delay the emergence of ESR1 mutations and further improve outcomes? Such efforts are ongoing in phase three trials, including in the Persifera trial with Giridestrant plus Falbociclib versus Falbociclib letrozole. Um, uh, Giridestrant, Falbociclib, uh, and letrozole matched placebo versus letrozole placebo and, and Giridestrant um, match uh, placebo. And then Serena 4 is doing that with Camisestrant. Again, the same concept can be replace the frontline therapy with oral SIRDs up front. Novel SIRMs are, uh, have entered clinic. This is one example with lasofoxifene. We saw Elaine 1 data, which is on your left hand, the Kaplan-Meier curves. This was looking at patients who were at least uh, for 12 months on a CDK4-6 inhibitor and have ESR1 mutations, and then were randomized to receiving lasofoxifene versus fulvestrant, and you see a numerical benefit here for this particular patient population. Four months PFS in the fulvestrant arm, six months in the lasofoxifene arm, did not meet statistical significance, but impressive to see that a result. On your top right are results from the Elaine 2 trial looking at lasofoxifene with abemaciclib. Again, a very small cohort of patients, 29 patients, but when you look at this combination, it gives um, a, a good clinical activity signal. Overall response rate is about 50% and median uh, uh, time to responses, and the median progression fee survival look very attractive as well. Median progression fee survival here is 13 months. And this has really led to the effort for phase three Elaine 3 trial that I was referring to, which is going to look at ESR1 mutant tumors, and we're going to randomize patients in the second line setting to lasofoxifene abemaciclib versus fulvestrant abemaciclib, and this trial is currently ongoing. <clears throat> Other agents are PROTAC, PROTAC are proteolysis targeting chimera. Essentially, the mechanism is it not only targets the estrogen receptor, but also an E3 ligase with an idea of ubiquitination and proteasomal degradation, so causing antagonism and degradation. And the first uh, drug here is veptagestrant, and this is data from a phase one trial where we see that despite median prior three prior lines of therapy, the overall response rate is about 12%, and median progression-free survival is 5.5 months in the ESR1 mutant patient population. And we have several phase three trials currently ongoing, including single agent veptagestran, veptagestran plus palbociclib in the first line setting, and then we have TACTIV E, which is looking at veptagestran with Everolimus as well with this molecule. And the last molecule I'll mention here is a, a CRAN or a complete estro estrogen receptor antagonist and a CERD. And so when we think about tamoxifen, we think that it 
you know, inhibits the AF2 uh, uh, domain, but not necessarily the AF1 domain of the estrogen receptor itself. Here, the idea or the thought is that maybe a complete recept uh, estrogen receptor antagonist can inhibit both the AF1 and AF2 and potentially uh, have a, a benefit from that regard. And this is data from a phase one study. This was actually updated by Nancy Lin at the ESMO meeting at a poster spotlight. This is data from the 120 uh, milligram cohort. It was an 86 patient um, uh, cohort. And uh, very pre-treated patient population, majority, about 44%, had three or four lines of therapies in the metastatic setting here. And you can see that uh, with respect to toxicity, you do see some GI toxicities um, with this class of drugs. A unique toxicity signal that we saw with this drug was neutropenia. About 6% of the patients had a grade four neutropenia, which was transient and approximately happening around four to six weeks of initiating therapy. Um, there is no increase in neutropenia when you're trying to combine this drug somehow with uh, palbociclib. There's no PKPK -PK interaction, and so that's comforting, and maybe the timing is why this is happening, but this was an interesting uh, signal that we saw. With respect to efficacy, we see that the clinical benefit rate is about 40 to 50 percent. Um, the ESR1 mutant patient population, the clinical benefit rate was about 52 percent uh, in this uh, cohort. These are the median progression fee survival benefits. On the top are the patients with ESR1 mutations. On the bottom, um, bottom are also with, um, um, uh, on the right-hand side is with ESR1 mutations. On the left-hand side is all patients. On the bottom are patients who were treated in the second or third line setting, the way we have with the Emerald trial. And when we look at that particular patient population treated in the second or third line setting, the median progression fee survival in the ESR1 mutant patient population is about seven months. So uh, OP1250, or palazestrant, as we call, uh, call it, is also being evaluated in phase three trials, and those trials are currently ongoing, including with combinations in phase one that have begun. So switching gears, so we've talked about ESR1 mutations and the breadth of data that we have or ongoing efforts we have. We also have newer data for targeting the PI3K AKT mTOR pathway. We have approval for Evrolimus. We have approval for uh, Alpalacib, a alpha-specific PI3K inhibitor. But now we just uh, got approval on November 16th uh, for a AKT inhibitor, Capivacertib, which is an inhibitor of AKT isoforms one to three, based on the results of the Capitola 291 study. And the study design is what is shown on the slide. So these were patients who recurred on or less than 12 months from end of their adjuvant endocrine therapy, did not have more than two lines of endocrine therapy or more than one line of chemotherapy for advanced uh, disease, no prior SIRD, no prior uh, agents of the PIPK AKT mTOR pathway. The hemoglobin A1C eligibility criteria was less than eight, and prior CDK4-6 inhibitors were permitted. In fact, 51% were required to have a prior CDK4-6 inhibitor. Patients were randomized to receiving Capiva. This is an interesting dosing schedule. Here, patients get 400 milligrams twice daily, four days on, three days off, with fulvestrin compared to full, uh, fulvestrin plus placebo. And the dual primary endpoints for this study were progression-free survival in the overall patient population, and progression-free survival in the AKT-altered patient population. What is that AKT-altered patient population? One or more alterations in any one of the PIK3CA genes, AKT1, or P10 loss of function alterations. And here are the Kaplan-Meier curves for investigator-assessed progression-free survival in the overall patient population. Improvement from 3.6 months to 7.2 months in the capiva surgical arm Hazard ratio here is 0.60, which was statistically significant. The dual primary endpoint looking at PFS in the AKT pathway altered patient population, again, 3.1 month in the control arm to 7.3 months in the Capiva assertive arm. Hazard ratio here is 0.5, and this was statistically significant. What is not shown here, but I can speak to, is that there was an exploratory analysis done for those patients whose tumors did not have any of these alterations. So overall, 44% had an alteration either in the PIK3CA, AKT1, or P10. About 16% were unknown. We don't know what the alteration status is. Either did not have good tissue, and we could not assess, or the DNA quality was not good. And when we focused on that non-altered patients and excluded the 16% unknown, the median progression fee survival hazard ratio was 0.79. And I think just looking at all that data, currently what we have approval for actually is um, the AKT pathway altered patient population. This is the safety data from the Capitello 291. I think the most important thing that we want to remember as we now are going to begin to start using this agent for our patients in clinic is that the most common toxicities are diarrhea and rash. The grade three diarrhea uh, rate here was 9.3%, and the grade three rash rate here was about 12%. 
Hyperglycemia rates uh, compared to what we've seen with, say, alpalasive, a PR3K inhibitor, here at least in this study, was 2.3%, so lower hyperglycemia rates. Stomatitis grade 3 um, was also 2%. So as I was saying, the FDA approval is for patients with HR positive, HER2 negative, uh, a locally advanced or metastatic breast cancer with one or more PIK3CA, AKT1, or P10 alterations, and a companion diagnostic that was approved to detect this with this regimen with the FDA was the foundation one tissue-based assay. Okay. So let's head back to the case. Uh, remember, this was our patient that had both an ESR1 mutation and a PI3 uh, alteration. And what would be your pick? Uh, Dr. Tarantino, I'm gonna come to you first. How would you, how would you select here? Well, it is a tricky situation, and we don't have much data guiding. It's, it's a cross-trial comparison. What we know is that the, the, um, there is a differential toxicity profile among the, the regimens, and so I would definitely be inclined to discuss all of the options with the patient, but the one that seems, by cross-trial comparison, something we should not do, but I'm doing right now, <laughs> the one that seems more tolerable is elacestrant, and in the presence of an ESR1 mutation, and um, a benefit on CDK416 inhibitors, I would favor elacestrant in this case. Absolutely, I agree. Okay, so um, she does receive elicestrant. Um, this is followed later by eximestane and everolimus. Um, then she receives capecitabine, uh, deemed to be uh, endocrine resistant at this point. Her disease progresses again. Uh, she has another biopsy. She's still ER positive. Her two is uh, IHC one plus now. Okay, Dr. Tarantino, we're gonna hand it over to you, but I have a 10 second question for Dr. Javeri. Uh, would you ever think about a CDK46 inhibitor in somebody that's premenopausal and won't do ovarian suppression, uh, so wants to be on tamoxifen? Would I do a CDK46 without ovarian suppression with tamoxifen? So um, that is some. So AK won't be, can't get on AI, right? Right, right. So there's data with abemaciclib to combine with tamoxifen. Um, certainly we have to educate the patients about slightly more increased toxicities that you can potentially see. Um, with uh, that, we've seen a slight more uh, prevalence of uh, venous thromboembolism with a combination of tamoxifen and abemaciclib, but certainly that could be something that would apply. It doubles the VTE rates to four to five percent. So short of that, I think at least we have that data and we can apply that. And while in Mona Lisa 7, we actually did officially study the combination of tamoxifen with ovarian suppression and ribociclib, given the increased QTC prolongation, we do not have an approval for that combination and that is not something that we necessarily utilize uh, in clinic as often, especially because of the concern for QTC prolongation. But say if the other uh, option was not there, that could be a discussion one can have. If you, um, in this patient had palbo early on, but uh, there was a Japanese study uh, recently presented that looked at palbociclib and tamoxifen in the Japanese population and showed uh, really very nice efficacy and beautiful safety. So I think that if somebody was gonna take, you know, determined needed to be on tamoxifen, OFS or not, I would use palbo myself, because that's where the best safety data is. You wouldn't use a bemaciclib, is that what you're saying? Uh, with tamoxifen, you know, I, get, I, I gave hard. tamoxifen and I bem it to a patient who had a PE, like, you know, yeah. two months later. So when I give it, you know, when we need to give that combination for whatever reasons, I usually try and use something for anticoagulation. People have said to me, but the rate's only four or five percent. I'm like, but that's in a study population. You know, in your clinic population, all bets are off. So I'd rather give something, you know, and it might be just be to take baby aspirin, you know, baby aspirin every day. Yeah, um, I've done that. Yeah. So. Okay, Dr. Tarantino, take it away. All right, let's switch gears. We're going to talk of something very different now, which is how we treat patients after progression on several endocrine treatment options. We know that usually, unfortunately, endocrine resistance develops. Sometimes it's after one or two lines. Sometimes you can still use four or five lines of endocrine manipulations, but in the end, sometimes you, you have to move, most of the times, you have to move to something different. And for decades, we were stuck to chemotherapy as something different. That works, of course, but it does come with toxicities, and it does not work for a prolonged time, and that is why we, we seek for something better than traditional 
chemotherapy. And one way to think of that is through HER2 targeted treatments. We know that HER2 targeted treatments are highly effective in 15% of patients with metastatic breast cancer that have HER2 positive disease. But since even among patients with HER2 negative disease, you have most of them that still have some HER2 expression, even if we call them HER2 negative. We know that this is a heterogeneous group that includes patients with HER2 one plus disease, two plus non-amplified disease, or even zero. And so the idea is that can we target this low expression over two that does not qualify for HER2 positive? It's not amplified for the oncogene, but still HER2 is present by immunohistochemistry. One adjuvant trial asked the question if we could add trastuzumab to adjuvant chemotherapy in patients with HER2 low early breast cancer to improve prognosis. HER2 low means HER2 1 plus or 2 plus non-amplified. In this trial, NSABP B47, after randomizing 3,000 patients to chemotherapy with or without adjuvant trastuzumab, the adjuvant trastuzumab really did not help did not improve invasive disease-free survival or overall survival, neither numerically nor statistically. Really saying that in HER2 low disease, the disease is not driven by the HER2, but still we can target it with novel agents. And these novel agents are antibody drug conjugates. For sure you've heard about this class of drugs before. How do they work? They're basically antibodies like trastuzumab or different antibodies linked from molecular linker to a highly potent cytotoxic, a chemotherapy. And basically the idea is to improve the delivery of chemotherapy. When I say improve, I mean reaching the tumor cell more selectively, but also changing the kinetic of the, of the uh, chemotherapy to make it prolonged and make it work better. And the first ADC to really show uh, activity beyond HER2 positive disease was trastuzumab deruxicam. This is basically trastuzumab linked to a cleavable linker to eight molecules of DXD. That is a highly potent topoisomerase inhibitor. And when it was tested in a phase one trial in several cohorts, including a cohort of patients with HER2 low breast cancer, which represent most of the patients with HER2 negative breast cancer, well, the activity of this agent was very interesting. In this pa in among patients with mostly or more receptor positive HER2 low or HER2 negative with lower to expression, pretreated with 7.5 lines of chemotherapy, TDXD achieved a response rate of 37% with a median PFS of 11 months. Really remarkable. And this led, first of all, to rethinking the targetability of HER2 negative breast cancer. We used to think that we could only target HER2 positive, only 15%, but now there is an additional 50 to 60% of the pie chart of all patients with metastatic breast cancer that we can actually target thanks to trastuzumab deruxicam. This is, was still an hypothesis because it was phase one data and required confirmation in a phase three trial. And, and, and it's important to remember that HER2 low as a biomarker is strongly linked to hormone receptors. And in particular, what we found when we looked at, at the large cohort of more than 5,000 patients at Dana-Farber is that the higher the estrogen receptor expression, the higher the likelihood of the tumor being HER2 low. So if you look among patients with ER negative, HER2 negative tumors, meaning triple negative tumors, about 40% still are HER2 low, have lower to expression. But if you move up, increasing ER expression, and you reach the highest expressors, you have two thirds of patients with ER more than 95% that are actually HER2 low. So the confirmatory phase three trial for this paradigm was Destiny Breast 04. And this was a phase three trial for patients with HER2 low, one plus or two plus H negative metastatic breast cancer that have previously received endocrine treatment and one to two lines of chemotherapy. Most of these patients were more receptor positive, although there were some patients also with HR negative disease, triple negative HER2 low disease. Patients were randomized to trastuzumab, deruxicam, or traditional chemotherapy, meaning capecitabine, every bulingium cytobin or a toxin. And uh, 600, uh, 713 patients were randomized. In the end, 557 were randomized to um, 2 to 1 to TDXD versus chemotherapy. The most commonly prescribed chemo was eribolin. You can see here the updated PFS curves that we saw this year at ESMO a few months, two months ago. And it was striking to see a doubling of progression-free survival with trastuzumab deruxicam compared to traditional chemotherapy. A and so with chemotherapy, you achieve a progression-free survival of a little above four months. But with TDXT, we really pushed this to 9.6 months. And, and if you look at the curves, there is a landmark analysis at two years, at two years among the patients that received 
aggressive chemotherapy, none was feel uh, free from progression, whereas with TDXD, still there was a meaningful amount of patients, 15% that were free from progression, really showing how impactful TDXD can be, even if there is no amplification of the HER2 gene. And this was both in the hormone receptor positive cohort, 90% of the patient in the trial, but also among all patients included in the trial. And most importantly, if we looked at the um, uh, um, exploratory analysis only among patients with triple negative HER2 low disease, what we see is once again an improvement in progression-free survival on the right, you can see it, from 2.9 months with chemo up to 6.3 months with TDXD more than doubling, and also overall survival from 8.3 to 17.1. This is exploratory, very few patients, only 58 were randomized, but I think it, it, it is consistent with what we have seen with TDXD, that it's really effective in patients with HER2 low breast cancer. When we talk of side effects, um, it is a selective delivery of chemo, but it still comes with chemo-related side effects. And so with TDXD, we still saw up to 70% or more rates of nausea any grade, although only 5% grade 3 or higher but also fatigue, also alopecia can be observed, neutropenia, so it's important to remember that disease chemotherapy, uh, and it comes with chemo-related side effects, sometimes even more than traditional chemotherapy, although we are learning how to manage this side effect much better than we knew before. And so nowadays we wouldn't see in clinical practice 70% rate of nausea because we utilize mostly a three-drug prophylactic regimen for nausea and vomiting up front. And we know that these are high, highly metogenic regimen for emergency CN guidelines, and so it is important to utilize at least a two drug, but it's even better three drug regimen up front. And so based on Destiny Breast 04, TDXD um, was approved last year uh, for patients with metastatic HER2 low breast cancer that have received a prior chemotherapy in a metastatic setting or developed resist re disease recurrence during or within six months of completing adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, two hours ago, uh, I had chan the chance to present this real-world data with TDXD, which basically show that the benefit of TDXD is dependent on HER2 expression, and, and so we know that her the, the activity of TDXD is highest in patients with HER2 positive breast cancer, but still there is meaningful activity in patients with HER2 low breast cancer, and even in HER2 zero breast cancer, both in this analysis and in DAISY trial, we see some activity. And finally, it's important to remember that HER2 low is a dynamic biomarker. I if you don't find HER2 low on a primary breast cancer, it can still appear, the tumor can still become HER2 low if you do a biopsy in a metastatic setting. And in our analysis, we looked at this evolution. We found the highest activity of TDXD among patients with stable HER2 low expression along the disease, but still meaningful activity for patients with changes. So we tend to use TDXD if there is at least one biopsy that tested HER2 low in the past. Shifting gears from her to targeted ADCs, th that was TDM1 and TDXD were basically a, a proof of concept that we could deliver significant benefits by delivering chemotherapy in a more selective way to patients with metastatic breast cancer. And so we, we thought that we could potentially expand that beyond HER2 as a target. A and a highly appealing target is TROP2. TROP2 is expressed um, by mo more than 90% of all breast cancers at a high degree by more than 50% of all breast cancers of any subtype, and, and it, there, it, there is a, a differential expression of TROP2 in, in the tumor compared to normal tissues, and, and also we know that it's an internalizing a, um, par, um, antigen, which is important because we want that when the ADC reaches the tumor, it does not only reach it, but it also gets internalized in the tumor cell to deliver the chemotherapy, and, and TROP2 was first of uh, agents targeting TROP2, antibody drug conjugates, were first developed a few years ago. The first one was Sacituzumab govitecan, and this is basically similar in the structure to TDXD. You have an anti-TROP2 antibody that is the Sacituzumab part, and then you have a molecular linker that allows it to link to, to eight molecules of a chemotherapy, a topoisomerase inhibitor, the govitecan. Then the, um, the, um, the govitecan is basically SN38. There is a metabolite of irinotecan. And this was tested first in, um, in a phase one trial that led to the approval in triple negative breast cancer and, and also in the ascent trial that led to the approval in metastatic, in the, the regular approval in metastatic triple negative breast cancer, but seeing a benefit in metastatic triple negative breast cancer made us think that we could bring that benefit also to hormone receptor positive disease. And the Tropics 2 phase three trial was, was aimed to confirm this benefit, not only in patients with triple negative disease, but also the largest subgroup of patients with metastatic breast cancer that have hormone receptor positive disease. Tropics 2 was a phase three trial for patients with metastatic breast cancer that 
was, or more sector positive, patients that receive at least one endocrine therapy attack same CDK46 inhibitors and at least two, and, but no more than four lines of chemotherapy uh, for metastatic setting. Patients were randomized to sacituzumab govitecan um, to our treatment of physician choice. It could be capecitabine, minoreldin, gencitabine, ribling, primary endpoint, progression free survival. When you see a demographic, this is a, um, a busy table, we don't have the time, but uh, I think it's important to note that patients received um, a median of three prior lines of chemotherapy and nearly all the patients had visual metastasis. And what we saw in this population is that sacituzumab govitecan led to a significant improvement both in progression-free survival and overall survival compared to traditional chemotherapy. Progression-free survival was numerically improved from four months to 5.5 months, statistically significant, and, and overall survival was improved from 11.2 months up to 14.5 months. And, and this drug is now approved since this year for treating patients with hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. Um, that have received uh, endocrine-based therapy and at least two additional systemic therapies in the metastatic setting. And when we say metastatic ther um, systemic therapies, we mean chemotherapy or ADCs. And beyond sacituzumab govitecan, there's a full set, many other top to target ADCs that are in testing. The, um, the other one that is in advanced phase of testing is deropotamab deruxecan. And uh, the name as the name suggests, it is a cousin of trastuzumab deruxecan. You have the same, that you have a different antibody that is deropotamab that targets TROP2. You have the same payload and linker, the DXD deruxecan, and we have a different drug to antibody ratio. In this case, we have four molecules of DXD linked to each antibody. This drug has shown in phase one trials to be highly active for treating patients with metastatic triple negative and or more receptor positive breast cancer, and this led to the design of the Tropium Breast 01 trial. This was a phase three trial including patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative IHC 0, 1 plus, 2 plus ish negative breast cancer. Patients were previously treated with one to two lines of chemotherapy and also endocrine treatment and were randomized one to one to deropotamab the second or investigator choice of chemotherapy with dual primary endpoint progression free survival and overall survival. And, and what you can see is that uh, most of the patients have received one prior line of chemotherapy that was the median. There were some patients with two prior lines and 90% of the patients received prior CDK for six inhibitors. In this population, there was a significant advantage in progression-free survival with deropotamab deruxecan compared to physician choice of chemotherapy. You can see that um, the, the progression-free survival was 4.9 months with chemotherapy, 6.9 months with deropotamab deruxecan, and the curves diverged very early, and the other ratio was 0.63. Response rate also was in favor of deropotamab deruxecan. It moved from 22% with chemo up to 36% with dato DXD. Overall survival is immature and we are waiting for longer follow-up, although the other ratio is trending toward favoring dato DXD, 0.84. And, and once again, we're waiting both for more follow-up and also for correlative analysis, because we know that these are selective, the targeted agents, ADCs, but in many cases, we're not seeing that the target, uh, the amount of the target on the tumor cell predicts the benefit. In TROPIX02, for instance, we saw benefit with sacituzumab govitecan irrespective of TROP2 expression, and we're going to wait to see if the same happens with daropotamab deruxecan. In terms of side effects, once again, we do see side effects with chemotherapy. With sacituzumab govitecan, we do see side effects similar to irinotecan, and, and so to SN38, we see fatigue, neutropenia, uh, alopecia, and also with dato DXE, we do see some of these, although numerically there were less side effects, and less grade three or higher side effects with dato DXD compared with chemotherapy. We do see in this case some TROP2 related side effects, and so we know that TROP2 is highly expressed on mucosal membranes, and this may be one of the reasons that led to about 50% of the patient in the trial experiencing stomatitis. There is a typical side effect of this agent. Also, nausea was associated, associated with dato DXD, and there were about 20% of the patients that had dry eyes. And it's important to remember with DXD-based ADCs, we do see this inflammation of the lung, interstitial lung disease, that in certain cases can be fatal. About 15% of the patient receiving TDXD, and, and about 3% of the patient receiving dato DXD can experience interstitial lung disease, and there have been fatal cases with um, TDXD, and with dato DXD there was one fatal case in, in, in this study. And so it's important to remember that we have to monitor carefully the, the lung of the patient with scans, CT scans of the chest performed every six to 12 weeks while on treatment with TDXD or dato DXD. And with this, I'll give 
the, the word back to Erica for continuing the case. Okay, so this was our case. So l assessment XMS St. Neverlimus, Cape Cytobine, and now remember that she's one plus. So assuming all of the options below would be approved and available, what would you recommend and why? Dr. Rugo? Um, you know, she has uh, HER2 low disease, and I think, you know, with the survival benefit we've seen with these antibody drug conjugates, we would use TDXD, and I think that that's going to be, regardless of the approval of DATO DXD, it seems as though, you know, the hazard ratio is relatively similar in DATO and SASE, even though medium one line, medium three lines, all the uh, caveats and the uh, PFS sort of shifted down a little. Uh, but with uh, TDXD, uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, a, I think a relatively greater benefit. And uh, I think that, you know, it's kind of a fascinating thing that none of us would have thought that her, her two targeted ADC would work better than a trope 2 ADC in this specific setting. I mean, I think all bets are off when we talk about triple negative disease. And also, I think that, that you know, in the HER2 zero, as you showed, you know, as you start losing the HER2, things change also. I mean, that was really fascinating that, you know, it's obviously early data and retrospective, but, you know, where you lose the you know, there was all this study at ASCO about if you kept biopsying, you get more HER2 low, which I personally haven't seen, actually. Biopsy enough, you will get a low. <laughs> I would biopsy the liver. You can biopsy it five times, still going to be zero. Uh, this is my experience with it. But I think that, you know, as you go to zero, you're also losing ER, gaining resistance, and uh, the drug doesn't work quite as well. But I think we would mostly use TDXD. I will say that in this patient, um, I don't think Everolimus works quite as well as a t drug targeted to PI3 kinase, and so I would use a drug targeted to PI3 kinase uh, rather than Everolimus in this particular patient before I got here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I agree. I think that TDXD, you know, has a uh, greater magnitude of benefit and probably a greater duration of benefit, really. And I think you're giving it every three weeks. It causes, its primary toxicity is nausea, but I have to say with using olanzapine, we got a lot better at managing the nausea. In the beginning, we were kind of like, oh, it's an ADC like TDM1, and you know, we don't have to worry about it, but now we're much smarter, and we actually changed the NCCN criteria to make it a, uh, that you could use triple drugs. So we made it highly emetogenic, which some people are unhappy about, but it's been great for the patients, you know, because then you can use triple drugs. You can always take away some something. And uh, then we use, again, the low-dose olanzapine that was presented today by our colleague from India, Jyoti Bajpal, and the mini orals, in case you missed it, because she looked at 2.5 versus 10. We only use 2.5. I mean, everybody would sleep for days if we gave them 10 milligrams. And it worked just as well. So this was all really good data. Whereas, you know, you got to deal with it. Nausea, hair loss, stomatitis with DATO, nausea, diarrhea with SASE, and neutropenia. So not as much nausea, more neutropenia, diarrhea. So Okay. Our patient receives trastuzumab deruxtecan, but develops further disease progression. What would you recommend next? Do you feel comfortable ADC after ADC, DATO, sasituzumab, intervening chemotherapy, or I'm not sure? Dr. Tarantino, what do you, what do you think here? I think this may be the hardest question of the night. I added and, this one. And it is, the, <laughs> it is the elephant in the room. The fact that we're starting to have many ADCs, and, and today there was a very exciting session of ADC post ADC. There were several presenters showing that in real world, the second ADC does not seem to achieve the same benefit of the first. And we know that in general, the more the, the prior treatments, the, the least the efficacy, but still, most of these ADCs have got top one in inhibitors as payload. And can we use the same chemotherapy over and over through ADCs? It is hard. It is hard, and I, I think there is not no great question, no, no, no great answer. I do believe that many people are, are talking about this sandwich strategy of utilizing a traditional chemotherapy in between ADCs, and I do believe it's not crazy to utilize a taxane. There is a highly effective chemotherapy that works in a different way compared to a toposomerase inhibitor in between TDXD and sasituzumab govitic, and that I will still use for treating these patients. But personally, I prefer to use something that works in a different way. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a tough answer because on one hand, you know, we do have worry about ADC after ADC, but they've beaten standard chemotherapy and chemotherapy is not giving us a whole lot of benefit. So it's, it's tricky. We're going to have to get more data. Yeah, I agree. We need more data. I will say that in now a number of series, because we saw one at ASCO, now we saw several here, that there are patients where, <coughs> sorry, in general, the first ADC works better than the second. But then there's this section at the bottom of those little uh, bar plots 
that uh, show that the second ADC works better than the first one, which clearly has to do with some mechanism of resistance we haven't been able to you know, test in real time. So I think that using sequential ADCs is a good option for our patients. Whether you wanna sandwich it in with a taxane or some other drug, I think is fine. The idea behind the sandwiching is that you would upregulate the receptor, but if you're using a different antibody, that probably doesn't matter as much. And if you've really messed up TOPE too, you know, you, you know, TOPE, the, yeah, I mean, you're, you don't know. And so there was, that in, there was an interesting study looking at this and seeing uh, TOPE1 alterations, but there was one patient who had TOPE1 alteration who had the longest course with three ADCs. So, you know, it's not 100%, and so we don't have a test yet. So I would say either sequentially, you could add a drug in between, but we don't know. <clears throat> okay, so a uh, couple uh, questions, and we're gonna end here. Um, question about why is elicestrin only approved for those with the ESR1 mutations if the PFS was also better in the intention to treat analysis? Uh, Dr. Javeri, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So I think it, it's a great question. The trial was designed to look at both, uh, uh, you know, all comer patient population and the ESR1 mutated patient population. It was not really powered to look at the unaltered patient population or those that did not have the ESR1 mutation. And, you know, when we look at that benefit that we saw in the all-comer patient population, the delta of benefit was really, really small. And so I think it was the idea that it's not, it's modest even in the ESR1 mutation, but definitely deeper and better in that patient population. And so to account for that, it was limited to the ESR1 mutant patient population at this point. Okay, perfect. Last question, because many people need to go to bed. Um, so 13.1 month improvement in overall survival in Monarch 3 uh, not cl uh, is clinically significant. It's not statistically significant. Do you think the lack of statistical significance will impact utilization? And do you think it'll impact reimbursement at all? It's been uh, starting to affect reimbursement for Palvo. So we could all answer no. Yeah. Anybody have a different answer? No. 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 Absolutely not. no. Okay. No. okay. We're unanimous. I mean, it's a fantastic note to end Big on. Big N-O. Yes. <laughs> so I want to thank everyone. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, and thank for our patient advocate groups for partnering with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash GHA 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca, Lilly, and Olima Pharmaceuticals.